I'm so excited. I get to spend time and you get to spend time with Mark Brackett. Mark, how are you today? I am doing well. I'm a little overwhelmed, but I'm feeling good. I like that you can label that. Uh, Mark is someone who you all need to know. And whether you are a student or you are a parent or you're somebody who feels emotions, because I think that would probably be everybody. Uh, <laughs> Mark has done just the most wonderful work. He's director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, also author of the book, Permission to Feel. And I I got the audio book, Mark. Oh, so okay. you've been reading to me. There you go. And I, and I really enjoy it. You did a wonderful job. Uh, I appreciate with, that. It was not easy. I can imagine you were very measured and wonderful and it would, held my attention. It's a terrific book. Thank and you. what's also exciting about today is I just got off a call with a neuro, a neuropsychologist and she was going over my test results because I went to get evaluated for adult ADHD, for ADHD, because sometimes it's just hard for me to get things done that I want to get done. And throughout mm -hmm. my life, I really struggled feeling like I'm enough and um, you know, a lot of shame associated with that. And I, I'm able to do a lot of excellent things and fool people, but I really struggle in many ways. I feel just doing things the way that I would like to do them. So mm -hmm. um, my philosophy is when I'm uncomfortable, I think people, places, and patience. And people, places, and patience means talking to a neuropsych. So she went over the results and, and I am solid ADHD. <laughs> so, um, you know, clearly there, there are some things I did very well on and some things where I, I didn't do so well on, but um, I wanted to label my emotions because we're going to get into the ruler approach and part of this, and, and, I, and I'm trying to do this in real time. So just walking through my my diagnosis, and I, I, I this is not a surprise, okay, but it's something that's a part of me now, and I wanted to start so just walking through ruler, and if maybe if if we can, I can use this as a way of like doing it in real time, sure. so I can apply what ruler is. Can you explain to everybody because I've done too much talking for a podcast with okay. Mark. Rockett. Oh, it's way too much. But I really wanted to set this up so that you could introduce what so many people already know. But please let us let us know what ruler is. Walk us through this approach. Well, so it's important to talk about ruler as two things. So ruler is an entire systemic approach to social and emotional learning that's been adopted by 5,000 schools now. And so we've reached about four to five million children across the United States and in 27 other countries. Um, and it's also the acronym for the skills of emotional intelligence. And so you probably want to know about the skills first. Absolutely. Okay. So when we think about emotional intelligence, right, we have to think about like, what do we do with our feelings, right? As you said, we got lots of feelings from the moment we wake up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night. And, you know, how do we map those feelings? Like, why do we feel the way we do? What's the right word? Do we talk about it? Do we strategize? Do we keep it? And so ruler represents the skills of first recognizing emotion. So how am I feeling? How are you feeling? And sometimes it's not that specific. Mm -hmm. It's much more at a kind of a global level. It's like, am I pleasant? Am I unpleasant? Am I feeling energized or am I tired? And uh, that's a tool we call the mood meter that helps us to kind of pinpoint where we are in emotion space. Then we can ask ourselves, well, why am I feeling that way? So I said to you earlier, I was overwhelmed. And the question is, well, why? Well, it's because I got way too much stuff on my plate, right? And I'm saturated, like my brain is saturated. And so that's overwhelmed. If I were stressed, it would be, I have too much on my plate, but I don't feel like I had the resources to do it all. That's the difference between overwhelm and stress. If I were anxious, I would just feel like, oh my gosh, there's so much uncertainty about the world. So that's the L in ruler, which is the labeling of that emotion. Okay. So L is about what am I experiencing? What are you experiencing? Then there's a decision we have to make. Like, do I feel safe? Do I feel comfortable with you, Harlan, to talk about it? 
Am I, you know, in a place where I can tell you that I feel that way, or am I going to be judged for it? Um, which is a big deal right now in society. People feel judged about everything, and feelings are included in that. So expressing emotions is knowing how and when to express emotions, right. understanding that there are cultural differences, um, racial, ethnic differences, gender differences, lots of different ways that people express feelings. And then the final R is regulating. That's the strategy piece. Like, what do I do? Do I keep this feeling or do I shift it? And how do I do that? So that's ruler. Recognize, understand, label, express, and regulate. And I'll say it again because I'm somebody who has to say things three or four times. No problem. I was uh, going for a walk earlier today and I was and I was actually singing it. You know, I don't know if you have a song for ruler yet. Are there songs for there are songs? The kids have done a lot of songs. Yeah. Yeah. Because I would think it's and it's and it's not just kids. And I should also emphasize the purpose of our conversation is I really want everyone who's listening to just take a moment to reflect and to ask themselves, how do I process my emotions? How do I feel? Do I give myself permission to feel? Do I give my children permission to feel for teachers and educators? Do I give my students permission to feel? Do I give my colleagues permission to feel? Do I give the administrators? I know you are also a professor at Yale. You work with students. You work with colleagues. And so many people have inconvenient feelings at inconvenient times. Yeah, it's life. Right. And it's hard because what I've seen, and I, and I also want to get in some real practical examples of yeah. how your students, how families can use some of these tools. Because I, I think understanding about feelings is incredibly important, but also having people leave with, with a sense of, okay, I feel like my emotional intelligence is not my strongest suit. Mm -hmm. I feel uncomfortable taking risks. I feel uncomfortable when I'm navigating change. And especially now, a lot of people are going to be listening to this during back to school. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a lot of people who uh, I'm so fortunate and blessed to interact with who are going to college or have parents who have kids who are going to college who are in this unbelievable state of heightened emotion and change. And I think it's so scary to feel. So starting well, there. It have to be, right? That's that's a mindset that somehow or another was created for us by society, right? right? That's that's a, a constructed phenomenon. We can have a whole new attitude about our feelings, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that that's also one of the goals. And I know just starting off as a headline is the question, are there such things as good feelings or bad feelings? Yeah, well, it's funny you asked that question because a couple days ago, I was having a phone conversation with a principal from a school in the Chicago area uh, who had trained students to become the ruler ambassadors for the school. So not just the leaders and teachers were doing it, but the students were actually supporting the development of these skills in their peers. And at the end of the year, She called me to tell me this. She said, you know, Mark, I asked them what was the biggest takeaway for them for being a ruler ambassador. And she said, I thought it was going to be, you know, that they love the mood meter or that they love another technique that we teach called the meta moment. It wasn't that. She said the number one thing that kids talked about was there was no such thing as a bad emotion. And I was just like, wow, that's elementary level students. Can you imagine like I didn't even know what the heck an emotion was in elementary school. Nevertheless, that there were good and bad emotions and that I was just really fascinated by that. And she said that it was important to them because growing up, you know, they're like 12 years old, that that they were basically taught when they were feeling those red and blue emotions, those are bad. Anxiety, anger, bad, right? They got in trouble for having those feelings or they were punished or they had to, like, it was something to get rid of. And that with Ruler, they had learned that emotions are information, emotions are data, and that it's not, I mean, I don't want to be anxious all the time, obviously, that's not healthy, but life is filled with things that makes a, that make us feel anxious, and I can learn to accept that and also strategize with it. 
Yeah, I love that from an early age of of information is not emotional. And I and I try to tell myself this as well that information is not emotional. I get information and I process that information and it can evoke a certain feeling or emotion, but information is just data, right? It's, it's emotions are data, period. That's the way we we see them in our work. Emotions are data, they're information. They inform us about are things going well for us or are things not going well for us? Do I want to approach the situation? Do I feel like right. avoiding it? They don't have to drive behavior, but they will inform the choices that we make. So, so just starting in that place of when we get information and, and that information. So today, going back to the example, I know I've talked about um, being diagnosed as having ADHD. Sure. So it would have made sense that I didn't go back to it at all because this conversation is so, is so interesting. But I, I was like, in my head, I'm like, I have to go back to that. So the information I get is that this doctor says, you took these tests, you have ADHD, right? So now it triggers feelings or emotions. And before I continue, do you want to explain the difference between feelings and emotions? Because sometimes like I get mixed up even when, you know, trying to re recycle. Not, scientists don't even agree on it. So don't worry about it. Okay. So there's, so it's, there's still some, some room yeah. for, uh, okay. So how do you, how do you define it? How have you defined it and shared? Depends on the day. No, just kidding. Yeah. The um, first, I think we should just talk about emotions because that's the primary category, right? right? Emotions are um, responses to things that happen in the world around us, right? So I'm walking in the streets and a car comes by me really quickly. I jump out of the way because I've appraised that situation as being dangerous and I'm fearful. So that happens from you know, an event happening in the real world, or, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'm kind of like, oh, you know, I feel like getting out of bed. You know, my brain is thinking I got to do all this work today. I don't feel like it. So it happens kind of from our imagination, or it happens from things in the real world. And, you know, emotions affect lots of things. You know, we are, are when we're angry, we're not thinking, God, I love you so much, right? <laughs> when we're angry, we're like, what you just said is an injustice, right? We narrow our focus. When we're feeling happy, it's like, whatever, life is great. So emotions shift the way we see the world, the way we think. They shift our motivation to approach, to avoid. They shift our behavior. Um, they shift our physiology. Um, that's an emotion. It's an automatic response to something that happens in the world. And of course, it, that's all formulated through our life experience meaning these are things we're taught. We're not born that way. And so we equate things with these feeling words. Now, a feeling is more your private subjective experience, okay. right? So for example, you know, um, my partner says something that I don't appreciate. I get angry. And then I'm like, you know, I don't feel like having dinner tonight. I don't feel like going to the movies. I don't feel, you know, it's more like this subjective kind of like post-emotion right. um, observation. Okay. Does so help? Yeah, it, it helps tremendously because I think what, what, what I want to do is for people to leave and when they walk out the door or they get a call or they get a text and there's a feeling, there's something that they feel well, what they're feeling is an emotion, that immediate response, and then it's the state it puts them in would more be like the feeling. Is that correct? Yeah, it's kind of like your um, follow up to the feeling, to the emotion. So, you know, and that, by the way, can lead to moods also, which we haven't talked about. Right. right? So like if I get angry at something that happens at home in the morning, and I'm driving to work and I'm like, I can't take it anymore. This is ridiculous that can put me into a bad mood, right? Okay. So the emotion that happened, if I don't regulate it well or deal with it, it will linger and kind of become not the anger, but the irritability, annoyedness, annoyance that might last for a couple hours. Okay. So emotions that are kind of the automatic responses. There's the feeling, which is kind of our private subjective experience around the emotion. Um, like the stories that we tell ourselves. Yeah. And then there's the mood, which is kind of 
generally longer in duration, but less intense. Kind of like, I don't know what it is, but I'm in a good mood today. Right. Can't really pinpoint where it's coming from. And how we process the input, the emotions, and how we how we then understand them and label them can actually impact our mood and help us to be better regulated or I don't I'm I'm so careful choosing my words in terms of you know better it will help us to be more we'll have a deeper expertise in regulating our our state um depending on the goal you know so if you're out protesting for legitimate reasons you want to keep that anger right it's going to help you know you make those very important points that people need to hear and so we we regulate emotions based on how we want to feel, right? So if I'm anxious before giving a public talk, and I know that's going to make me fumble my words or lose my lose track, I'm going to say, Mark, take a deep breath. Mark, you got this. You've done 550,000 presentations. This is all in your imagination. You're going to nail this. Oh, yeah, you're right. That's true. Pretty much everyone's gone well. Okay, good. Go. And so I'm... Right. I'm dealing with the anxiety they might be having um, and I want to feel calm or confident. Yeah. So I'm, I'm regulating to achieve the desired emotion state. I was while you were while you were sharing, I was thinking there was a student that wrote to me about how they're going to college in three weeks and they're so nervous and they're starting to feel nauseous and they're worried about making friends. They're worried about their classes. They're, they're just scared for this big life change. Yeah. So, you know, this is going on. So just to, to walk through ruler, so recognizing that the that they're they're feeling this and they probably don't want to feel this because that's why they're writing to me. Yeah. So importantly, that's normal. I don't know. I'm an introvert. I'm always I and mean, people think, Mark, you're so outgoing. You give all these big speeches. I'm like, I'm just good on stage. Like, put me in a crowd, I'm a mess. Right. Like, I'm not actually as outgoing as people think I am. Um, and so it's understandable that based on your personality, based on life experiences, some things are going to make you feel more or less comfortable. And going off to college, I don't know about you, but when I went off to college, I was really freaked out about it. Um, I just like, oh, my God, my roommate and like everything was like just so different for me. So first is goes back to Harlan, right? Permission to feel. Don't judge it. Because as soon as you judge it, then you start having feelings about your feelings. Then you right. start getting like, I'm feeling shame or embarrassment because I'm nervous about going to college. Right. It's okay. You're right. a lot of people. Um, and just because you're nervous, by the way, doesn't mean that it's gonna, you're gonna fumble. I mean, that's an important piece that sometimes emotion management or regulation is not about shifting out of the feeling you're having. It's just about saying, you know what? I don't know about you, but during the pandemic, the first few months, I was a freaking anxious mess. Right. And there was one point where I'm like, Mark, you have no control over this coronavirus. <laughs> Mark, you have no control over whether your university opens or closes this week. So like, it's a lot of anxiety and you're just going to let it ride. Right. And once I give myself the permission to just let it ride, all of a sudden it wasn't as controlling, you know, over yeah. me. Right. Uh, um, it's the example of, um, you know, I talk about getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and yeah. life's 90% amazing, 10% a bunch of BS. And when you fight the 10% BS, it takes up 100% of your time. Yeah, well, all things difficult, you know, our brains like to pay attention to too much, right? We have it. We have that negativity bias. You know, it's the the example of like, and I give a lot of public talks as I was sharing. And so like 500 people will give me a standing ovation and one person will be like, that was the worst talk ever. Right. And that, that one person is what I ruminate about for the next three days, right? I'm oh like, yeah. 499 other people loved it. Doesn't right. matter. Right. Uh, and so- you know, that's, that's based in a lot of our, you know, history and, you know, things of that sort. But going back to your, the example you just gave, I think that <clears throat> part of the challenge that students have, like, I know this, firstly, importantly, 
we don't do enough preparation to help kids or young adults go off to college. We're not helping them visualize like what it's going to be like to have a roommate who might be of, of a different race or a different gender or sexual orientation or whatever it might be. Um, we don't give enough um, support in terms of like the autonomy and the independence that they need to, you know, manage their lives and homework and going to classes and eating and exercise, all these life things and relationships. We can do much better in that preparation, yeah. which make the experience less anxiety provoking. But at the same time, I think that what happens oftentimes for students is that they make mountains out of molehills. Mm -hmm. And my recommendation is think about the little steps. Don't try to think about like, I'm eliminating my anxiety. That's a lot to think about, right? Think about like, what's the one thing I can do to support me in feeling a little less anxious? Do right. I need to 500 friends? No. I need to meet like one person the first week. Okay, I can make that goal. I can go up to say, I can push myself to go say hello to somebody, just one person, you know? And so I think little steps are really important for people. Yeah, I think that really is, that's that's such a wonderful way to to validate the feelings and to then make it manageable. And I think, you know, everything is so unknown and there's so many variables and there's so much trauma informing the unknown that people catastrophize. And then there's, yeah. there's, there's this spiral, <clears throat> then they're feeling all of these things that they don't need to feel because they haven't happened. And yes. And that's part of it. A lot of it is just, um, you know, that cat cat catastrophizing, like you were saying that you're making stuff up. You know, I've been in, you know, I've I've worked with a lot of people that do that. And it's, you know, it's like they don't get the phone call back from the person they went out on a date with. And they're like, they didn't like me. They found somebody else. I'm like, have you thought they just might be busy? Right. <laughs> they have other things they're working, right. thinking about other than you, that maybe it's like not their number one priority to call you back right now. Yeah. They're, gonna, you know, they're not obsessed like you are about texting people as soon as you get the text. I think that permission to feel, I think in order to feel and in order to give oneself permission to feel, they need to be okay with who they are, obviously, which is so connected to rejection. And I, and I was mentioning, I'm obsessed with rejection and and um, I am going to get to my ADHD diagnosis and, and okay. it ties into this. So I am still aware of it. Um, it's gonna be the end of the it will be for a long time just so you know <laughs> there's gonna be like five minutes left and I'm gonna be like hey mark so let me explain do you want the doctor it's like anyone listening to be so annoyed um but all right i got distracted okay so in order to give oneself permission to feel we need to be okay with ourselves after we allow ourselves to feel what we feel right we we need well, to be okay no matter what i would think the mindset it's a the mindset. Mind, the mindset is like <clears throat> all emotions are up for grabs. It's all good. Like there's no bad emotion. Like I said earlier, that's. I, I wanted to say something though about that because it's very important that people realize that as children, if we're talking about kids right now, young children, right? You can't. It's hard to give yourself permission to feel when you're very young. You've got to grow up in an environment where the adults who are raising you and teaching you understand that principle. Otherwise you get the students that I was just talking about that, well, anxiety is bad. Like I have to, I can't be anxious because then that means you're weak. Or if I get angry, that means I, and I'm dysregulated, that I'm gonna get in trouble. If that's not permission to feel, right? That's, that's being taught that there are good and bad emotions. That's, we're gonna wipe. So my point is the adults who are raising and teaching kids have to cultivate these mindsets and create Absolutely. the conditions for children to have the permission to feel. And then you can cultivate that mindset and grow it as you as you get older, because there'll be plenty of things that try to pull it out of you, believe me. And that's, see, I see, like, I want to be an intervention partner with you um, in terms of our 18, 19, 20-year-olds, our adults who don't have, never had these tools, who have figured yeah. out ways to mask and numb to not feel because 
I could say, give yourself permission to feel, but they're going to be like, you know, when I do that, I feel like shit. I feel awful. You know, I hate myself. I hate everybody around. So Mark, I, I don't really need to give myself permission. And Harlan, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I would rather not. It's too distracting because I have to get my degree in my job and I have to take care of my obligations. So I think like the pushback, and this is also the pushback with the growth mindset. And this is where it ties into, this is where it ties into rejection and, and really unpacking rejection, self-rejection, um, rejection by circumstance, those people around me, um, raw rejection, this idea that no matter what, not everybody will always respond to me the way I want. There's this, that no matter what I do, no matter what I say, I may not get the outcome I desire, but any outcome is a good outcome because you can process an outcome if you understand the intricacies of rejection, which ties into when I look in the mirror, do I like myself? Can I tolerate myself when I take my clothes off? When I am alone, do I actually like and love myself? Because if I don't like myself or love myself because I'm in a state of self-rejection, then I am not going to give myself permission to feel because all I'm going to do is bring up old feelings that I don't want to dig into. Like, mm -hmm. You know, how, how does that how do you get someone to give themselves permission to feel when every time they felt or expressed emotions or have been through something traumatic and difficult has programmed their brain that you don't want to feel? It's a really good question. And, you know, the, the answer is going to be, is, is a, is a complex one. You know, I think, the you know it's you know if you don't like the way you look whatever that you know in terms of your body right. image or your facial you know your whatever you are um, the um, I think there's part of what we have to cultivate in our lives you know for example I'm five foot eight and a quarter um, notice I made that little point you're tall Mark yeah there you go you're tall I'm you're five I'm five five and a half, five, six with the right shoes. Uh-huh. And so I'm never going to be a basketball player, right? It's just not going to happen. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be six, six. And there's, I have no control over that, right? This is like, I just did, you know, I'm not going to start taking growth hormones, hormones at 53 years old and they wouldn't probably work and it'd probably be dangerous for my body. So it's not a good idea. Right. So like there's part, you know, we, we, we do have to help people engage in radical radical self-acceptance right it's just it's really important and i think the reason why we don't do that is because you know unfortunately right now we're just all we're doing is making social comparisons everybody you know where i work you know which is at an ivy league university and i say that because it's i'm saying that because it's the type of student that we attract oftentimes is someone who um has been a superstar in certain areas they come from oftentimes, you know, backgrounds where parents are very successful. Um, and even still, they're the, they, they have the highest SAT scores, the highest grade point averages. They play instruments that I never heard of. Mm -hmm. And they are endlessly thinking that everyone else is smarter than they are and better than they are and have more expertise than they have and can right. study less and get better grades and have more connections. And, and how is that helpful? Like, you know, and I think that's part of what we have to help people develop right. huh? is like sitting around in a state of envy and jealousy all day long. How is that going to help you achieve your goals? How is that going to help you have well-being? It just won't. Oh, it eats you up. Yeah. It, it and so going back to that point of you were saying earlier about being enough, those are that's a lot of work to help people have that mindset that I am enough, especially when you're in a world where it's all about social comparison. Yeah. My, my approach has been to introduce the universal rejection truth and the universal rejection truth should be on the periodic table of elements, the URT. And the universal rejection truth says not everyone and everything will always respond to me the way I want. It's a mm -hmm. law of nature. You can be the best, the brightest, the most desirable, and not everyone's going to always respond the way you want it is a law of the universe. And if you fight this law of the universe, you have a fixed mindset because you think that if someone or something doesn't respond to you the way you want, you're the problem or they're the problem. But there's this other element called the universal rejection truth. 
you know, your story, and I encourage everyone to read Permission to Feel, your story of being a survivor of abuse, of having to keep secrets, trauma, you know, put in a state of self-rejection, living in fear that you're not enough. Um, the universal rejection truth is that you didn't choose any of that, right? Like none of that was, you were born into a world where horrible things you had to endure. And the universal rejection truth, I think gives us the ability to walk alongside it, these things that don't always have explanations that then give us the ability to walk through the door so we can give ourselves permission to feel, recognizing that our life experiences are not things that are a product of our choices or any of the, the things that we could have controlled. It's that like the pandemic. Yeah, the, I think, you know, I want to spend a few minutes, if you're okay with it, on what you were just talking about. And, you know, I can use myself as an example, but it's not necessary. And is that, you know, we, as we grow up in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, oftentimes what happens is that other people define our reality for us, right? Um like when I was being bullied throughout my elementary and middle school years, you're too fat, you're too, your nose is too big, you're too Jewish, you're whatever it is. And, but there was no one else in my environment saying, Mark, you're like really smart. Mark, you're really, you know, you're really clever. You have a great personality. I didn't hear that. All I heard was you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too this, you're too this, you're too this, you're too this. And what happens is that that's um, gaslighting right? What's happening is that other people are defining who I am. I'm only hearing that and rehearsing that. And, you know, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. And it's a huge problem in our society because we're not helping young children or even adults to sift through that. It's like, wait a minute, right? If I were Mark, the PhD in psychology and the professor of motion yeah. intelligence when I was 12 years old, I'd be like, wait a minute, buddy. Like, you don't have the right to define my reality for me. I'm actually a really nice guy. I'm caring. I'm compassionate. You know, I'm actually really smart. Um, and like, I don't really understand what you're trying to do right now. Like, yeah. what's your goal right now in terms of being mean and cruel to me? But does I don't have any resources. I don't have any support systems to to do that because again, we have not made this side of the report card, social and emotional development, right? part of our education system. Yeah. So it's like, we just get dealt, what we get dealt from our environments, but we're not, ever, we're not really helping children build that awareness and that resilience and those strategies. Yeah. And I think that the role, like the, the role that you play, I mean, you're, you're, you're remarkable in, in helping you know, so many so many parents, so many students to even talk about emotions, to even think about emotions yeah. and to be introduced to emotions and feelings and and to then be able to process that and for the kids to teach the parents. They do. That's it's the most remarkable thing when um when my kids will 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 call me out and and say, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of an example, but I don't they're they're great at making it clear, you know when my emotions aren't in check, you know, why, why are you, why is your voice getting loud? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, Oh, I didn't even realize it was, you know, and they have the, in my family, my kids have the room to express how they feel about my interactions. And, and I actually find it interesting because all it is is information that helps me to reflect so that we can, as a family, be able to communicate but you I want to. So you can um, use it against them later on. Just kidding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, they use it. They're they're. Well, just, I want to share with you one other thing, though. That yeah, it's been a profound kind of um, finding for me in my research, yes. which is that I've asked tens of thousands of people if they had the person that I had in my life, that Uncle Marvin right? That person who gave them the permission to feel who my parents didn't have the abilities to do that. My mother was very, very, um, had very severe mental health challenges around anxiety. My father was, you know, came from very poor circumstances, just like a survivor, but 
no resources and a lot of anger, a lot of resentment. And so they didn't really know how to support me when I disclosed my abuse, when I was being bullied. You know, my mother would just say like, I can't handle it. And my father would be like the toughen up kind of toxic masculinity dad. Yeah. And I've asked tens of thousands of people to describe the Uncle Marvins they had or they wish they had. Right. And, you know, the number one characteristic is non-judgmental. Uh, the second one is empathic. <clears throat> now, I share that with you because when I present to families, which I do quite a bit, I present these data to them. And what's interesting to me is that, by the way, of the 50,000 people, let's say, in my study, only about a third say they had someone in their childhood who gave them permission to feel. Of that third, only about 5% said it was a parent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I present those data to parents, and you know what they tell me? I don't think it's my job to be the Uncle Marvin for my kids. <laughs> Okay, well, whose whose job is it? Well, they, out, it's like outsourcing. It's like right. you know, right. and what's interesting to me is that when I really push parents on this, it's kind of frightening to be honest with you. What I hear, the first is they're afraid to find out how their kids really feel, right? And the second is they don't know what to do about it once they hear about it. And it's like, when I interpret that, how I hear that is I'm afraid, I'm afraid to know how they feel because the rejection of being a parent who's not adequate. Yeah, I failed. I have failed, basically. I have failed. And then I then what to do about it is I then have to reflect on my own inadequacies and process my own feelings, which is something I don't have the tools to do. And it, and it, and it like- They didn't have an emotional education themselves. Right. And it connects to that rejection piece. And this is where- like, I, I really, I hope we have the chance to talk more because I, I am like obsessed with this because I really feel, I really feel like rejection is the missing piece. Understanding rejection, becoming intimate with rejection, walking alongside rejection, because when I can be okay with rejection, I can be okay going through these exercises and processing. Um, I want to touch on something. Is, by the way, there's yeah. a term that you may be familiar with called rejection sensitivity bias. Yes. Which is that after a while, you start looking for it. You're anticipating it. I have a relative like that. You know, it's, we've gone out and then I'll say something like, you know, I, I don't feel like going out for, you know, a drink after the movie. Oh, well, you know, I didn't tell you how to come out with me. I'm like, it's not that I don't want to be with you. Right. It's that I'm tired. Yeah. yeah. That, but that, that rejection is, um, at the forefront. Yeah. And I think it's that, that self-rejection loop where I've been rejected so many times that when I actually do offer something and someone's not interested, well, then the problem is me rather yeah. than some other circumstance. And it's a default. And there's so many students who are just overcome with anxiety. You know, I was at an event the other day and, you know, making friends, you know, this idea of making friends, because it's so scary because who's going to like me or making friends has been difficult. Mm -hmm. But in college, it's a different dynamic and it leads to this other, this other point, because we have so many parents, I have a lot of high school families and students, and I can tell you, Mark, I was a very mediocre student, you know, like two points, yeah, you know, and you went to Rutgers, Rutgers is a great school, right, but Rutgers isn't Yale, right, mm -hmm. I mean, and I was looking, because I was like, God, I wanted to just look at Mark's path, because you have like over 150 professional papers, like, I mean, you are, I mean, you're really, some, some would say brilliant, I don't, you know, I don't want to, you know, oh, no. I, yeah, that will get me in a lot of trouble. I know. It's like, no one wants to hear that. And I think especially someone, but like, truly you are, you I feel like I am accomplished. You're, I will accom say. you're capable and you are able to articulate difficult points and tap into something. You know, I, I was an advice columnist for over 20 years and people said, why do you do that? And I said, because the headlines in the newspaper are boring. The real headlines are our emotions and how we process those emotions. So I did that for like 20 years. And now oh. I do the things I do because I really look at myself as a partner in this. And I had a similar childhood in some aspects. And the thing that just baffles me is we have a system that's created where for a student to go to Yale or to go to Dartmouth or to go to these very highly selective, highly rejected schools, 
they need to almost be perfect. Almost be perfect. Have very little perfect, room. To perfect in terms of what we've created as the right. criteria for perfection. Absolutely. Yes. But then you have the students who may be sophomore year in high school or junior year in high school or at some point deal with a trauma or are working through some sort of emotional event, something unexpected, and maybe their grades suffer, or maybe they have to get some additional treatment, or maybe they have to even check out for a month or two or a semester, and they, and they get this therapy, and they learn these tools, and they become in touch with their emotions, and they understand other people's emotions, and they see why people get caught in addiction and why they choose to numb out doing this and that. And then they come back to school and their GPA is like a 275 or something, right? And then they get back on the rails and they do well, but they don't do the same as their peers who are then judged by admissions officers when truly all they've done, and those other students, maybe they've done all the work too, but there's a lot less work I think that's done emotionally than students who go through something, but those students who go through all of these things, they are not rewarded and recognized. Correct. But I think they're heroes. Yeah, I mean, that's just not, you know, we have to, part of, you know, I have a whole, I'm actually writing an article right now about why we've had, you know, 30 years of emotional intelligence, 30 years of positive psychology, 30 years of social emotional learning in schools, and the world's getting worse. Um, and it's not that those concepts are bad. They're great concepts. My whole career is based on these concepts, but the implementation has stunk, right? Uh -huh. Implementation right. is poor because we don't, it's a quick fix society. It's like yoga is the answer to everybody's problems now. You just take a deep breath. It's like, okay, I've taken my, I've been taking deep breaths for 40, <laughs> 53 years. It's like, right. I still have a relationship problem. <laughs> right, right. Right. And so the, we're not, it's not, part of the fabric of our society, right? What's part of the fabric is, right? Test scores, grade point averages, you know, the CV that impresses people. Um, and what happens, right? Unfortunately, and this is coming now, I'm coming with Mark, this psychology professor guy, is that I get a lot of resistance to the teaching of these concepts with my college students, because they'll say things like, I didn't need these skills to get into the university. Right. And I always joke, well, you're going to need them to get out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the truth is, you know, you know, marrying somebody smart is fine. You know, everybody you know, smart's good. We want, you know, there's nothing wrong with being smart, but we want to marry. Don't you want to marry someone who like understands yeah. your feelings, you know, who you feel like you can be intimate with, who you can hug, who you can kiss, who you can talk about, like, I think, I think about how many people are in relationships and they've never really shared how they feel with their significant other and how alienating that is and how lonely. We're, we're, you know, we know from the Surgeon General's report and other research, people are chronically lonely. Chronically lonely. And then there's the hopeless piece. And I, and I just wanted to touch on that too, because I've been tracking hopeless teenagers for years, since 2011. The American College Health Association has this data. They do this wonderful survey, the ACHA, the uh, NCHA. And in 2011, 45.2% of all students said they felt hopeless in the past 12 months. And in 2019, pre-pandemic, that number was 55.9%. Male, female, uh, non-binary. You know, of course, we know our LGBTQ students suffer more than anyone. Then we have the CDC information that came up recently, you know, where two thirds of mostly, they said females and the male number was very low. But we have all these students who are hopeless, you know, 18, 20, 19, who are dealing with so many of these challenges. Mm -hmm. And my question for you is, one is, why do you think so many people, so many students are hopeless and, 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 and why, why, why is this happening? And then, the second part is, and I know we're, we're getting towards the end of our, our time here, like, what can we do about it? What can somebody do about this? A student, what could someone do who's feeling yeah. these feelings? Well, firstly, I just want to say that, um, and I'm gonna, I have to say this with caution. So 
is that asking people about like these words without yeah. knowing what they how they the definitions they have for these words is problematic. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you the example. So a couple of years ago, I did a study with my students and they all said, 77% of them said they were stressed out. 70, wow, that's a lot. But then I had them journal about all their stressors and none of them fit the definition of stress. Mm -hmm. They didn't have too many demands and not enough resources. What they wrote about was, my friend's parents are richer than my parents. My friend has connections in Hollywood. My other friend's mother is a big producer. My other friend's father is a politician. They're all going to get jobs. They're all going to get their internships. And I'm going to be the one that's left out. And so what they were really feeling was envy, as I shared earlier. And so that's a, that's a that what you do to help people regulate stress. Like for stress, I'm, I've been stressed out before, right? It's like too many demands, not enough resources. That's mm -hmm. either take stuff off my plate or get more help. That's what's going to alleviate, you know, the distress. But for envy, that's a cognitive task. I have to really start working on myself, going back to that feeling of completeness and, you know, contentment. Yeah. And so I'm not convinced, you know, from these studies that, that the data are very accurate. I think some of it is just boredom, honestly. Yeah. We, we miss, we're, we're like, I'm bored, so I feel hopeless. Um, and my i want to encourage people to do better research <laughs> to really understand children's experiences yeah um and that's you know we use terms like everybody says the word anxiety or depressed and while there is a lot of depression we have to be managing and anxiety i'm not convinced that um you know people are as depressed as we're saying they are, because I think that people are mislabeling disappointment and discouragement for depression. Oh, that's that's so really that's a really interesting take, and I'm glad to hear that because it is more hopeful, and it's and it's it's incredibly it interesting. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's critical because we just you know we just all these like and it's also contagious. So like what I found yeah. in research is that you know if parents just talk about anxiety, the kids are saying they're anxious. They don't even know what it means, but they say they're anxious. Right. <laughs> I actually had this happen to me. I was in an elementary school visiting and the teacher was talking about all this anxiety. And I went up to the kid afterwards. I was just really curious. I said, you know, what does it mean to feel anxious? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what the word meant. Right, right. Well, that's that's really interesting. I, okay, so I want to respect your time because we're we're coming towards the end. Maybe we'll get a part let, let me Let me just, with that said. Yes. We do have a society where people are not experiencing enough pleasant emotions Absolutely. and there's a lot of unpleasant emotions. And those are the full range from discouragement to hopelessness, to despair, to depression, from frustration to anxiety. I get that. And it's something important. A, we got to give people permission to feel. Absolutely. It's okay. There are probably legitimate reasons. The top reasons that students feel especially, you know, in the Chicago area, um, school shootings, kids are anxious about that, right? There's been a lot of stuff happening in our country right now around that. So they they get up in the morning worrying about that. I didn't worry about that when I was a kid. Right. They're worrying about climate change. They're worrying about the political turmoil in our society. And so I'm saying this because I stand firm in my belief that the goal is not to fix kids. The goal is to make society a better place for children to develop in. And that we need to not just thinking about teaching kids regulation strategies, but making sure that our politicians, our leaders, our superintendents, our school board members, our community leaders are role models for what it means to be an emotionally intelligent person. Yeah. I think light, a light source, you know, there's light sources and, and dark source. And, and just from working with educators, you know, you, you know, from the first three words, if they're a light source or a dark source, um, if they're yeah. student facing or if they're self-preservation, if it's self-preservation person and those, those who are student facing, you know, they tend to be ones who give themselves permission to feel and encourage others to feel. I know uh, I, I want to be really respectful of, 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 of this time. And I have like, you should see, I have like, I have like 30 questions here. Like we barely got into anything. And 
Um, happy, to, happy to do a part two at some point. Oh, it's it's just there's, you know, so what I want people to leave with, and I'm going to take 20 seconds, my ADHD thing, I felt anxious, I felt um, relief, I feel hope that I can learn about myself and 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 understand and, and, um, you know, regulating it and working through it and using ruler as a way to process has been helpful, especially on, on this day, um, to take big issues. And I encourage everyone, I'm going to keep I'm going to give you the resources so that you can look at Ruler. You can recommend it to your schools. You could also, I'm going to leave a link to Permission to Feel. Thank because you. The book I have another available. resource, by the way. I, You know, is it the app? Yes. Have you I, seen the, the How We Feel app? I got the app. I got the app. And I, and I, I, the app is wonderful, everyone, because it gives you ways you, every day, you, well, you could tell people. Yeah, well, it's the app that's based on my book, and um, I'm very proud to say I collaborated with the co-founder and CEO of Pinterest and a team of wow. amazing um, engineers and designers, and then my team at Yale, and we built this app that is free, that has 144 emotions and their definitions and 36 research-based strategies to help people manage, so just check it out. You can track your emotions, and it's very, very cool. So I'm going to do that's how we feel. And I love the logo. I love the look. I love the feel. I love how the emotions pop out when you've got the four different quadrants and the colors. Yeah. And it was great. I loved how all the emotions were there because I could barely name a few emotions. So uh, how we feel, I will introduce that. So people will leave with that. They're going to check out permission to feel. Um, you can send me questions and, and maybe we can do like a Q&A with Mark. The other, the last thing I want to mention to you, it's like you have like two minutes to answer a question. But Mark, why is it so important for people to feel? Because emotions drive everything. Emotions are what make us human. And so how we feel influences our attention. It influences our decisions. It influences the quality of our relationships, our mental health and our performance. And so... What that means is that if we can develop the skills of emotional intelligence and learn how to use our emotions wisely, people can make sure their dreams come true. And uh, I feel that that's the missing link. As my uncle Marvin would say, the missing piece in our education system is understanding that emotions drive nearly everything. And I want to end by saying, Harlan, we always say you got to label it to regulate it. And so now that you are clear about what one of your challenges is in terms of attention, it should be very freeing for you because now you have a plan and you know to um, you can create a plan to help you manage it effectively. So what a yeah. gift. I, I feel like it's a gift and I feel like our time together is a gift. I, I really am grateful for you and your work and your team and your grad students and the students who have been in your classes and your collaborators, because what you're doing is so important. It's foundational. It should be required for students, for parents, for families. And as they navigate change and work through life, understanding emotions and being able to process them and give oneself permission is, is just fundamental when it comes to healthy relationships with themselves and with others. So with that, um, Mark, I hope people devour everything you're putting out there. Thank and you. Um, I'm just grateful. This is a new relationship. And um, I, I, I will do everything I can to support what you and the rest of, of your team is doing. So thank you so much. Harlan, great to meet you. Thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. And I appreciate the work you do. Thank you, everybody. Mark Brackett, thank you.